Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and I apologize, we are starting just a minute late, but I wanna welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Marie Eagle and uh, welcome on behalf of the ARC of Michigan and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Today we have with us Sandy Kosky from Michigan Alliance for Families. Sandy will be giving us an overview of Michigan Alliance for Family Services um, and all sorts of great information. So uh, as it says, shows on the screen, participants are muted, videos are turned off. Please feel free to submit questions using the chat. Um, we'll try to answer questions as we go if they apply to the topic. Otherwise, we'll hold them to the end. There will likely be time at the end for questions as well. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Sandy. Oh, great, thank you so much. Let me get my uh, PowerPoint pulled up. All right. Are you successfully seeing my uh, PowerPoint? I can see it, yes. All right, wonderful, thank you. Hi everybody, welcome. I am Sandy Kosky and um, I work for Michigan Alliance for Families. And um, I'm here to share a little bit about who we are and the work that we do and, um, and to um, hopefully um, introduce you if you have not heard of us before, accessed our services and have a, a good understanding or a better understanding of what Michigan Alliance for Families does. So we're gonna start, I'm gonna start off because oftentimes people um, are wondering about how we, our services are funded because everything through Michigan Alliance for Families is available at no cost and we are special education focused. And so our funding comes from the US Department of Education, Office of Special Education and Rehab Programs, um, the Michigan Department of Education, Office of Special Education. We also get some money through the Office of Great Starts, Early Childhood. And then we have an, um, a, an initiative going uh, now, a small little grant that comes from the Pacer Center what that's called Project Launch and really focuses on the transition of um, youth and foster care out of the school, uh, out of um, high school and kind of into adult life, um, really focusing on those who are receiving special ed services and continue to receive them after school, high school. So that's kind of a new initiative and I'm very much involved with that and um, learning lots of things about foster care and the needs of um, kids who are coming out of foster care. Uh, so the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which is the federal law that brings you special education, within that law, it requires that all states and territories have what's called a Parent Training and Information Center. Um, we just shorten them, call them PTIs. And so Michigan Alliance for Families um, get, uh, is Michigan's federally funded Parent Training and Information Center. Through the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, States are required to um, create what's called a state performance plan. And within that performance plan, there are indicators. Um, are, some of them are compliance indicators and some of them are what are called results indicators. So the work of Michigan Alliance for Families um, is absolutely tied to that state performance plan in terms of for our little ones, those birth to three, um, who are receiving services through early on, it's around helping families know their rights, be able to effectively communicate their child's needs and helping them help their child um, develop and learn. And then on the, um, uh, and what's called the Part B side, which is the three to uh, 21 year olds in state law or in federal law, um, we're looking at, um, we're, we're connected to a results indicator that is about the percentage of parents who say the schools facilitate their involvement and their child's and um, and their child's education, their child with a disability. So our work is connected both at that federal and the state level. And the one question that um, uh, always seems to come up um, when we're when we're kind of doing this kind of who we are and what we do is this whole um, uh, when would I refer a family or when should I contact um, Michigan Alliance for Families? And I would tell you that um, the majority of our calls come to us mostly when somebody is having a problem or is frustrated with um, their, situ their child's situation at school. But we do support families who think their child may be eligible for special ed education services, 
and through that evaluation process and also stick with them really all the way into their child is no longer eligible for special ed. So I would tell you that if a child has been identified as having a disability, may be eligible for special education or is, we're there to help families. We wanna educate, we wanna empower so that parents can truly be a member of their child's IEP team sitting at the table um, and involved in making those decisions. Um, the same with, uh, so our families who are have individualized service plans, if you have a plan that's getting you special ed services, we can help you better understand that system and the services that you're getting so that you can better advocate for your family's needs and for your child. Um, we can help you better understand both an individualized family service plan as well as um, an, uh, as well as an, an individualized education program. We can help parents know their rights. And in particular, if a child is having with a disability or suspected of having a disability is having behavior challenges in school that's getting in the way of their learning of the way of the way of others, we can absolutely help families navigate that. So when should you when should parents contact us at any point, but it doesn't have to be around a crisis. And I'm going to give you some other, if I'm going to get, let you know what kind of services we offer. Um, it, um, should you want to reach out and contact us. So it starts with these kind of really just basic services. We provide information, we educate, and we support and mentor. So our staff are not advocates in the sense that has been referred to in the past for special education, where somebody would go to uh, a meeting with a parent and um, sit at a table and help that parent advocate an IEP meeting. We are around supporting mentoring education. So I like to say we're the teach them to fish folks. Um, we're the ones who want to teach families the skills they need to advocate within the special ed system because those same skills they're going to go on and use should they need to advocate within the community mental health system or within the vocational rehab system or with the social security system. All of the skills that we can do are transferable skills to those other systems. So um, we support and we mentor parents. So it's not uncommon for our parent mentors to work very closely with the family, get them ready to go to a meeting, and they're getting that phone call when the parent's on their way home from the meeting to find out how it went. Um, so these really are our core services, and I'll, I'll dive in a little bit more. I'm going to show you our website and, um, and our webinars and all of that in just a minute when we, go, when we navigate over to our website. But what I want you to know is that Michigan Alliance for Families is indeed a statewide project. So we provide this level of support, education, and mentoring to parents in the state of Michigan, both the upper and the lower peninsula. We have what are called parent mentors, and you can see by this map that we are broken down into geographic areas, and we have a parent mentor who covers those different areas. Um, and you can see as you move, move farther north, they cover bigger geographic areas, more land. Um, that's because it's really, we really are dividing our resources within the state based on the number of, of IEPs in a given area. So as you get more rural, um, we have uh, many more counties that just one parent mentor um, covers. Um, and I'll show you our website in just a minute where I'll show you how you can locate and find out who the parent mentor is that may cover the area that you live in and how you can get their contact information. But I'm gonna let Victoria, who is one of our parent mentors, tell you about Michigan Alliance for Families. And if there's an audio problem, cause I didn't click something, let me know and I'll reshare. Hi, I'm Victoria Martinez and I'm a parent mentor with Michigan Alliance for Families. At Michigan Alliance for Families, we provide free information, support, and education for families whose children or young adults receive or may be eligible to receive special education services through the state of Michigan. Every Michigan Alliance for Families staff member, including me, is a parent or a family member of an individual with disabilities. We each have firsthand experience with Michigan's special education system. In listening, communicating, and problem solving. Our staff support families in all 83 counties across the state. We help parents navigate 
navigate the special education system and become more involved in their children's education. We can assist parents in knowing their rights, effectively communicating their child's needs, and advising how to help them develop and learn. We're here for you. Just let us know how we can help. There we go. So a little bit more about um, support, mentoring, education, and um, information and referral. So you can see um, we have uh, we have a presence on social media. Um, we also access, we also utilize a YouTube channel, um, and uh, we provide. At one point in time, we provided in-person learning opportunities for families and those who support them. But of course, at this point, still, um, like most people, we are virtual in the, virtual in the things that we are offering to families. Um, we have, um, I wanna talk just a minute about um, advocates and our, um, and our connection. Michigan Alliance for Families does have um, contractual relationships with advocates around the state so that if the situation has just really gotten sticky and a parent isn't able to navigate it on their own, um, we can refer our family on to an advocate, but our motto is to refer, refer, um, to refer on, but to hold on because we want them to come back once they've um, been able to uh, utilize the advocate to um, solve a problem. We want to, we want them to come back so that we can continue to educate them. So we do have some access to advocacy uh, advocates, sorry, um, but they are few and far between um, in the state, and so there's a triage that. Um, we do in terms of passing on um, families to those advocates. We try our best to help families be able to solve the problem um, themselves. So um, one of the uh, new things that has just, um, has just come about is that um, we actually now have a dedicated line where parents who um, would like to speak to someone who um, is fluent in Spanish, that they, we have this 313 number that families can call and um, leave a message at and somebody will get back to them. But we do have somebody monitoring that line. That 800 number that you see, if you call that 800 number through the magic of technology that I barely understand, it will route you to the parent mentor that is nearest to where you live. And so it has to do with the exchange on your phone, um, how you'll be routed. Our parent mentors are always um, uh, always make sure that when they get a call from a new parent that, it, it, that the technology has been successful and that they indeed are a family that lives within their geographic region. And if not, they're gonna get them connected with the parent mentor who is, should the technology fail you. Um, we have an, um, a fairly comprehensive website. So if you're not familiar with that, um, that's actually where I wanna navigate you to next. Um, and so I'm gonna stop sharing and um, make sure that I can get us over to the website before I start sharing again. So, so there's some things that I want, I'm gonna to wanna to point out to you um, that may help it easier for you to understand our resources and um, access them. So this is Michigan Alliance for Families website if you haven't spent any time there. And I'm gonna start off by um, taking you over here. Um, well, I'm gonna actually stick for a second to the um, homepage because there are two things I want to point out to you on the homepage. There's Victoria again. I wanted to point out to you, um, first of all, currently in the state of Michigan, there are multiple agencies that are looking for feedback from parents whose children are in what's called transition. And so that transition means planning for the future. So that could be any child from 14 all the way up to 26 who are actively involved in planning um, for the future in a transition process. We're looking to get some feedback from parents. And so we would really appreciate it if you're on here, if you're a parent and you fall in that age range, or if you know parents or work with parents, if you could navigate to this web, uh, over to our website and this link will take you directly to that survey. It'll take you more than five, but less than 10 minutes to answer. Um, it would be really, really helpful. It's, this survey is gonna be open until December 10th. 
and it's going to be used to help inform a model that we're trying to develop as it relates to um, uh, transition and improving our outcomes for students with uh, disabilities. So um, I'd really appreciate that if you would, if you um, know someone or if you are that someone, you took the time to click that survey. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to make you aware of if you, if you didn't know is that the Michigan Department of Education has a list of what are called Family Matters fact sheets. And I'm gonna click on that. And I think if it keeps me on the same page, you can still see that. So unless, Marie, you tell me you can't see the MDE webpage, I'm gonna keep going. I think you're good. Oh, perfect, thank you. So these are just short, um, well, they're, they call them one-pagers, but front and back one-pagers, uh, about all things related to special education. So you can see there's something here around ABA, as well as behavior intervention plans, um, uh, uh, completing high school with a diploma or without a diploma, functional behavior assessments, if you've heard of personal curriculums or PBIS. These are all really nice one page um, explanations. Here's an explanation for an independent educational evaluation, um, initial evaluation, some things related to transition. Then we also have some things around child find and what are called educational development plans. Um, least restrictive environment and free and appropriate public education. Here's, there are a couple here that are nice um, introductions to what is an individualized education program. And so these are all kind of everything. Um, there's procedural safeguards, which has, which has to do with your rights, 504 plans. Um, so all of these go on for quite some time and they're nice, easy informational um, sheets um, if you're looking for something that is Michigan specific and, in and the intended audience is parents to explain something related to special education, these family matter documents are great and you can access them, for access them through our, um, that front page on our website here where it says family matters. All right, so if I go up here next um, and go to about us, I wanted to be able to show you our regional map live and in person. And um, you saw this in the PowerPoint. So if you were to navigate over to this number uh, and uh, click on it, you would see for Clinton, Eaton, Ingham, and Shiawassee counties, Andrea is um, the parent mentor and that is her email address. And although we do have that 800 number, all of our parent mentors also have a local number that parents can call. Um, let's see. Uh, so all you have to do is click on it and it's going to take you over to wherever um, to the information up here about a parent mentor. Now, Wayne County, of course, is unique in so many ways in Michigan because we have so many people that live in Wayne County. So we actually have uh, three parent mentors. We actually have a vacancy right now and we're interviewing. Um, I'm not sure if the application process is still open or not, but if you know somebody who lives in this area, um, who might be a really great parent mentor. Um, we are interviewing. So we have par three parent mentors who cover Wayne County and you can see that how they are um, divided up. Um, we also have um, more than one parent mentor in Oakland County, but we have some positions there that we're filling also because we had some people who were promoted into new jobs. Macomb County also has um, two people. Of course, those are the three counties where we have the highest population here in Michigan. When you move over here into Kent, we also have two people who cover um, the Kent County area because again, of the large population. So this is one way to be able to find them. Um, you can also just go down and look at by county and be able to find who the parent mentor is, their local number and an email address. So we have about 22, I think, parent mentors all together, plus our I and our staff. All right, I'm gonna navigate over next to this button right here, which is special education resources. And um, these are some of our top topics. Because, and so they're kind of dropped down here for you to get easy access to. But, um, uh, what we have listed here is kind of an A to Z topic, all things related to educa educating a child um, 
uh, with a disability uh, and uh, a, a wide range of uh, topics. So if you want, I'm going to go to well, let's just let's just go up here to behavior because that's just one big topic, isn't it? Behavior, and you'll see that from here there's some information. And then this is going to navigate you to other places on our website that are going to give you more specific um, information on a topic. So there, although they're under all under behavior, it allows you to be able to go and learn more about behavior intervention plans, behavior as communication, um, some information about bullying and um, functional behavior assessments, and seclusion and restraint. Um, so going to this um, all topics A to Z really is fairly comprehensive um, and gets you to some really good information. Right next to this is our COVID um, page. Um, and what we have tried to do is to consolidate all the information, both state and federal as it, federal, as it relates to educating students with disabilities um, in the time of a global pandemic. And so you will find that information underneath this COVID tab. We have a babies and toddlers page that's looking at our birth to three-year-olds. I wanna bring you back over here though to um, some of our educational opportunities. So we have webinars and we offer live webinars um, everything is a webinar now. We used to have uh, in-person ones, but everything is live. And so I'll get to our upcoming events in a second here. But when we do um, many of our webinars, we record them like this and we post them up on our website. So when you come to access them here um, on our website, they are kind of broken into categories. So you can see we have a number of them as it relates to special education and COVID. Eligibility, if that's something that you've wondered about. Um, a series of them related to um, IEPs. We work really hard to keep all of our webinars under an hour. So if that means we have to break them up into you know, a big topic into smaller pieces, we will do that as opposed to doing a really long one. Um, some rights in special education, some things related to um, early on, which are babes um, birth to three-year-olds. And then down here, we have a, several videos related to transition, which is that out of high school planning. Um, and then some other kinds of just uh, additional topics. So all of these are recorded and you can find them of course on our YouTube channel. The easiest way to get to that is up here at the top of our website. And if you click on that, it's gonna take you over to where all of these webinars are housed. Uh, so you can see they are all, let's see, I think if I do videos, cause they're stacked this way. So, um, but you access all those webinars here through our YouTube um, channel. And they're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you can't sleep, they, I'm hoping they won't put you to sleep, but they might very well not let you go back to sleep because they've given you something else to think about. So, uh, right. So that those are our webinars. I'm gonna navigate over here for just a minute to upcoming events. Uh, and so things are kind of thinning out right now because we're about to enter, day, enter the holiday season and Frankly, we um, don't get very good attendance much after mid-November until uh, mid-January to things that we do. So some things are, it's beginning to thin out, but you can see that we have um, some things planned through until mid-December. Um, if you were to come back here um, uh, after the first of the year, we'd have a whole calendar up and ready that'll take us through until the spring. In particular, I would tell you that in February and in April, we are doing an on, we do an online IEP course for parents. And the reason it's for parents is because it's a course. It's not just a presentation that you listen to and take notes. It actually is very interactive with the Zoom where you hear some content and then you go into a Zoom rooms where you're able to try and take that information 
that you heard and look at your kid's IEP and ask some questions. And then you also get the support of one of our staff between classes to again, help you um, apply the information and learning to your kid's IEP. Um, that is a four week course. So it meets once a week for four weeks. It's, it will be offered on Tuesdays in February and Wednesdays in April. Um, and so if you come back to our, this spot on our website after the first of the year, all of that will be listed here. So this is where you would see our upcoming events. Now I want you to be aware that we have a newsletter. And if you do not have a news, if you do not subscribe to our newsletter, I want you to know that it's a one-way communication. We send things to you and we don't ask for anything. We don't ask for money. We don't ask you to volunteer. And the newsletter comes out once, um, at once a month at least. Sometimes there's a second one in that goes out if there's something that's going on and we think we want and we want to make you aware of it. It's really quite easy to sign up. All you have to do is click here, put in your email address and your name. And then if um, we, have the, we have these counties in here because um, sometimes with our learning opportunities, especially when we were in person, um, if you click those, you'd be able to get information about those local um, uh, learning opportunities that we're, um, that we're doing. But we still are doing some local kinds of things, small group things. Um, so if you just kind of click the counties, you'd get information that might specifically be um, addressing things in your region. And then you just hit submit, and that's all there is to it. And it's a great way to stay in touch with us. Um, the newsletter also will can contain information about um, a trend that we're hearing about. So. Um, if we're hearing about something, especially as it relates to um, uh, rules or regulations or something with the law or a policy, if there's something we're hearing from our parent mentors, our policy coordinator will address that in a short article in the newsletter to help clarify to get accurate information out, especially if we're hearing kinds of different things all over the state. Um, we'll also spotlight some information related to our early childhood families. Um, in that newsletter. So it's that easy to sign up. You just have to come to our website and hit this newsletter, or you can go here and hit newsletter. We of course have a presence on Facebook and Twitter. I'm not much one for Twitter. And so um, I'm gonna show you our Facebook page that you can like us on Facebook. This is a way we have some, uh, uh, some uh, new staff that we're kind of introducing and getting people to know. Um, and uh, you'll see some of our webinars that are up there and then just some posts. So like us on Facebook, that's another way to know what is going on with us. And I am looking at my list and I believe that I have I uh, reached everything that is on my list. I'm going to stop sharing so that I can go back to my PowerPoint so we at least have that up there. And so I told you I could get through that, Marie, probably pretty quickly. So um, I don't know if there are uh, specific questions people have about Michigan Alliance for Families, but I'm also um, open to trying to answer any questions that you might have regarding special education. Well, thank you, Sandy, that was excellent. Um, we have had a couple of questions and I wanna remind folks that if you have a question, as Sandy said, specific to Michigan Alliance for Families or in a broader sense related to special education in Michigan, please feel free to submit it using the chat. Um, so Sandy, the first question that we received was, when does a child go to an ISD versus mainstream? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's not a little question. <laughs> uh, so the foundation in which the individuals with, so the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the federal law, which all states need to be in compliance with, um, has two um, very foundational concepts that they are built on. And that is what is called the Least Restrictive Environment, or LRE, and a free and appropriate public education. Least restrictive environment is the concept that says students with disabilities 
should be educated to the maximum extent possible with their non-disabled peers. And only when, with the use of supplementary aids and services, is, is that not successful, would we remove a child into a more restrictive environment? So what that means in everyday language is that we wanna start with the premise that a student with a disability is first and foremost, the student in the grade they would be in if they didn't have a disability. So if they're a second grader, all students in public education, including kids with disabilities, are general education students who receive special ed services. And so if that kiddo is a second grader, we need to have a conversation as a part of the IEP meeting to say, how do we support this child given all of our resources, accommodations, modifications, and available services to keep that child in the general education classroom with their non-disabled peers? We have over 30 years worth of research, 40 years, I think now, worth of research that tells us that we get the best outcomes post-school for people with disabilities when they have been included in the general education classroom and curriculum. And so because the research says that, we need to look at supporting them there first. And that's not just putting a kid in a gen class ed classroom and saying, good luck, because that's just dumping. That's setting everybody up for not being successful, the teacher as well as their classmates. But really what supports, what do we need to do to support that child in that environment? And then once we know that it just isn't working and we've tried everything, we may remove the child from that classroom for a short period of time. So in that case, we oftentimes see that happen with students who have learning disabilities, who maybe need more individualized instruction in reading and math. And so they go to a resource room. Then we may see a child, a more, a more restrictive following that is a child who spends more than half of their day in a special education classroom. So that maybe they are going into a general ed classroom for specific subjects. People love to say, let's put them in um, a gen ed classroom in gym and music and art. And I know many kids who have not been successful in gym and music and art. But once we let them join for social studies and language arts, they were much more successful. So it's an individual child decision and how are we going to support that child? The most restrictive environment would be for a child who spends, well, a child who spends all of their day in a special education classroom with limited access to their non-disabled peers. And then the most, most restrictive environment is when those children are removed from a, a building that has um, general ed students and are only provided services in a, um, in a uh, classroom only with people with disabilities and a building with only with people with disabilities. And that is typically an ISD program. And really the intent is the law of the law is that we're really trying to, on an individual level, make the decision, what's the least restrictive environment for that child? So, that may not be the most satisfying answer to the question that you asked, but that's the problem. I'm sorry, that's the process that needs to be gone through. Um, unfortunately, we have parents who experience um, it being done in reverse and them saying, oh, the, the, the system saying to the parent, oh, your child has autism, you need to go look at the autism program. Oh, your child has a cognitive impairment, well, you need to go look at the CI program. And when we do that, without talking about what the child's individual needs are to be supported in a general education classroom, we're not genuinely honoring least restrictive environment. So that's kind of my short answer, if you can believe that's a short answer. Um, and if you were to take a look at our website and you looked for information around least restrictive environment and free and appropriate public education, that would be where you'd begin to get more information on understanding kind of how those decisions related to placement happen. Um, so that's that's my answer, Marie. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, Sandy. Uh -huh. um, so another question that we received is, what if a child is in need of out of district education? What is the process for determination? 
or what is the determination process? Can you and repeat it one more time? Absolutely. What if a child is in need of out of district education? What is the determination process? So, so I'm going to make a an a, um, assumption that we're talking about, about a child who is currently receiving special education services in one school district. As part of least restrictive environment, sometimes we um, sometimes we. Uh, we, we may look at what one school district has to offer and recognize that it's not meeting that student's needs. And, but that there may be um, a school district that has a different kind of program um, within the same intermediate school district. And then there would be a discussion at the, um, at the um, administrative level with both of those school districts around how, what that might look like. Um, each school district and each intermediate school district kind of runs different, so it's kind of a hard question to um, answer. There are some places um, where um, there are agreements within um, an, an intermediate school district, which may, can, may cover one or more counties, that children, for example, who, have, who are deaf or hard of hearing, that the deaf or hard of hearing program is gonna be located in school, um, school district A. And so any kids who live in that county who need to access that service would go to that school district. And that would be an IEP team decision. So going to another school out of district education um, needs to be a part of the conversation within an IEP team meeting and developing that individual child's plan. Um, but the, but when we're really looking at that, a child going to another district, there has to be administrator conversations because um, when that child leaves one district and goes to the other, their foundational grant that they get for educating all kids might need to go with them. If there are costs over and above that financial, um, that financial uh, foundational grant, sorry, then there, may be, there needs to be a discussion about who's gonna pay for those additional costs. So there is, there needs to be an administrative discussion, but, the, the, it, but it starts with the IEP team having a conversation about what the student's needs are and can those needs be met in this current school district. And on any of these questions, I would encourage you to go and look to see who the parent mentor is in your area, whether you are a parent or you support parents and um, have them help you understand how it happens locally um, where you're at. All right, got another one? I actually do not. Those, hmm. That's the end of the questions that have been submitted right now. Um, okay. So again, if anyone has questions, please feel free to submit them via chat. Otherwise you might get some free time back <laughs> here before the scheduled end of our webinar today. I do want to remind folks, I did put in the chat that uh, a recording of today's webinar along with a PDF of this presentation will be shared with all participants within a couple of days. So look for that in your email from Zoom. It does not come from me. I, that sometimes gets people confused. It comes directly from Zoom. Um, and we are working on a page on the ARC Michigan website where we will post all of these recorded webinars uh, so that anyone can access them easily in the future. So Sandy, I guess I'll just ask, I don't see any more questions coming in if you have anything you'd like to end with. Um, if I was to end with anything, it would be to tell you that I absolutely believe that our single big um, best resource at, at Michigan Alliance for Families are our regional parent mentors. They are the ones whose boots are on the ground where you live. And not only have they been working to develop relationships with parents, but they also have been working to um, build relationships with um, people within the administration of school districts so that they can better not understand how those school districts work so that they can help families navigate to the right person. Um, I know from personal experience that there were times that I was trying, I was addressing a problem that wasn't getting resolved. To, to really discover that that person was not the person that I should have been addressing the problem to, that it was someone else. And so our parent mentors kind of understand how each individual school district operates 
and who it is to begin to help you um, point you in a direction within your within a local school district to get the um, support or an intermediate school district to kind of get support with um, solving a problem or getting a question answered. So I can't speak highly enough of the role of our parent mentors and the crucial work that they do in your communities. They are one of you trying to help families and those who support families in their area. So um, don't hesitate to reach out to them. And so Sandy, just to clarify, it can be a parent themselves or it could be someone supporting a parent who reaches out? Absolutely. Absolutely. We have grandmas who give us a call, aunties. We even, there are even times that um, we'll get a call from um, a, a, a teacher or an administrator within the school who is asking to pull in our parent mentor to introduce them to a parent because it's a parent they know they need to work with. We also have work, um, it's not uncommon for us to, to work with um, uh, people who work within the community mental health system who have children, who have people, uh, children on their caseload who are still receiving special ed services, we are more than willing to help you understand the system because we know if we can help that community mental health worker uh, understand the system, they can better help not just one family, but many families. And so you heard me describe um, the IEP course as for parents only. That is the only thing that we do that is for parents only. All of the offerings that we have on um, that our upcoming events and our webinars they are absolutely available to anybody who's seeking the information to be able to support to get the best educational outcome for our kid. The IEP course is that way because we are actually helping parents apply it to their kid's IEP. But anything else, anybody is welcome to attend. We want kids, we want kids with disabilities to get the best educational outcome possible. And if there's somebody who wants to join in on a team to be able to make that happen, we want to support anybody. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, this is a wonderful presentation. I really appreciate your time. I want to thank you and thank uh, everyone who participated in today's webinar. I do want to mention before we end that we will likely not hold a webinar in December uh, because of the holidays, again, <laughs> and lack of attendance, but we hope to resume uh, those again in January. So thank you all for attending. Thank you again, Sandy, and um, we appreciate your time. Uh, you're more than welcome. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk about Michigan Alliance for Families. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks so much. And everyone have a great day.